Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Greetings. Welcome to my show, Adila, on the Blake Radio Network's Rainbow Soul, where we will get up close with our radio guests. Before I introduce you to my very special guest for today, I'd like to share with you my thought for the day. It is a good head and a good heart are always a formidable combination. Mr. Nelson Mandela. And so it is. That quote certainly speaks to today's guest, who is extremely multi-talented and who does possess a good head and a good heart. He was a series regular, I hear him. He was a series regular for 10 seasons, beginning in 1977, on the very popular ABC TV show, where he was adored by TV audiences around the world as the fun-loving bartender Isaac Washington. He has numerous, and I do mean numerous, awards for his work over the years, including the NAACP Renaissance Man Theater Award, the Heroes and Legends HAL Lifetime Achievement Award, Oakland Ensemble Theater's Paul Robeson Award, and James Cagney Directing Fellowship Scholarship Award, as well as a Drama Log Award. He is an actor, director, playwright, producer, and educator. Now that is a lot of recognition and a lot of hats to wear. I am speaking now of my guest for today, who I absolutely hear in the background with that laugh and that beautiful smile, the much-loved and my friend, Mr. Ted Lange. Thank you very much. What a lovely introduction. Oh, you are so deserving. I know that you're in your car. I know you got caught in traffic, so I know that you're on your cell phone. So you're going to have to make a special effort to speak from that diaphragm just a little bit more, and perhaps we can also turn up the volume as well so that everybody can hear you really well, because everything you say, I know our listeners are going to want to hear. Okay, you got it. All right. Now, before we take a look at your illustrious career that spanned over 40 years, let us do what I like to do with all of my guests, and that is to go back to your childhood Mm -hmm. So that our listeners are able to get a sense of you, the person. Where were you born okay. and raised, Ted? I was raised in Oakland, California in the 60s, when it counted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was when all the protesting was going on. Oh, you know, when yeah. all the free speech movement, I was in the middle of all of that. I know. I came along at exactly the same time. I think, arguably, that's probably the most colorful and significant time in American history. So I absolutely relate to that period of time. Oh, how yeah, was absolutely. It, it was, uh, it was a really uh, a chance to mature, find out who you were, and uh, trying to make a difference in the yes. world. Yes, and you certainly did that. We'll hear more about that in a little bit. Now, what was it like growing up? In your household, we all had a different household that we grew up in. What was yours like? Well, you know, I, my mom was a single mom, and uh, I had my brothers. I have two other brothers that, that grew up with me. We were going to, you know, uh, living in Oakland. So we did everything everybody else did, which was, you know, you went swimming on the hot days, and you played football, and you, you know, you hung out with each other, read comic books, the whole thing that most childhoods go through. My my deal at that time was I had no idea what I wanted to do because I wasn't very good in school with my studies, such as math or uh, English, and I got lucky in that a teacher of mine, when I was in junior high school in ninth grade, he put me in a play, and then that was the only thing that I really excelled at, so that sort of set my life course. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I was, the guy, I, was the come back. Guy. I was the guy that made all the jokes sitting in the back of the class when the teacher didn't want you to. <laughs> right, and you're still making them, yes? Yeah, yeah. So the teacher said, he put me in a play, 
And then he saw me get bit by the acting bug. So the next four months, it took four months before they would do the next play, he blackmailed me into not making any jokes. Wow. He said, if you, you want to be in the next you play, you can't make any jokes in my class. And he had me because I, I didn't say nothing in his class. Wow. So yeah, you lived up guy. to that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you so, wanted it. You know, That's and, right. and the very next play that I did was Macbeth. Wow. And then so I you played. started out early on with Shakespeare. Yeah, I did. And I, I did Macbeth, then I went to high school. I did the same play again, Macbeth. And then I went to the Colorado Shakespeare Festival when I was uh, 19 and wow. did Macbeth again. And that's when I found out that it was difficult because prior to that, I didn't, I didn't know that it was such a big deal, you know. Right. Yeah, it was a lot of language, and I am a bit and all you know. Exactly. You know, that gotta, Shakespearean you rhythm. You got a character, and you got to figure out what he says. So what you, what's the big deal? And you know? own and the language as if you speak that way every day. Yeah, well, that's how I. That's how I grew up in the ninth grade, though. In the ninth grade, the guy said, "Oh yeah, you." Just speak like this, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Now, you're ahead of me. I want you to slow down a minute because I want to go back and I want to give props to your mother. Oh, yes. My mom now, I remember. That. Huh? Go ahead. Say, go ahead. I remember your mother, Miss Jerry Lange, because during that time I also lived in the Bay Area, and I remember very distinctly watching her on TV Public TV, KQED, yep. in San Francisco, yep. in the 70s, yep. and she had her own show. Now, yes, I did. can't remember if I saw her on Turnabout or on Woman Time. Was she on both of those? Yes. The, uh, That's what uh, I the thought. show started out as, uh, I think it started out as uh, Woman Time, and then they changed it to Turnabout. That's right. It was a spinoff. Oh, yeah. That's right. And yeah, yeah. I remember her beauty and her elegance. And it, well, it, thank you. Yeah, if my memory serves me correctly, I think I remember that she had a natural during that time. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I was responsible for that natural. Are you serious? How so? Oh, I'm responsible for that natural. Now, my mom, my mom was very uh, uh, politically aware and very well read, and she loved to argue. And so she would take these positions, and I would say, Mom, if you're going to take that position, you know, you should at least have a natural. Wow. I don't need a natural to, to think, and I don't need a natural. I said, no, I understand that, but it would make a, a point if you had a natural. Well, I, I don't need a natural. <laughs> so we did that for about a year. By the end of the year, she went out and got a natural. <laughs> well, you know what? I yes. thank you for that because she became a role model for many African American women because she wore her hair naturally the way it was. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And my she had brother that beautiful teased her because cat. my brother and I teased her because we are the ones that you know because she would talk some some good smack. You know, what I mean, she would talk some tough stuff. And then we said, but mom, if you just had a natural, you would, you know. <laughs> and she uh, finally she said, okay, okay, okay. Well, I'm sure I'm glad she did. She was beautiful, and I believe she yeah. had a, a gap in her teeth like I do. Didn't she have a gap? Like I do, too, like me and you. Yeah. And yeah, that yeah, yeah. smile that you inherited from her. So I'm, I'm spending a couple of minutes on your mother because this is black history that we're talking about, and our listeners need to know from whence you came. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And also, I'm going to stay with this a couple more minutes, and then we're going to move on to your career, but it's important, I think. And also, I, when I was doing research on your mother, I found an Oakland Post newspaper interview she did in 2000. That was the year she celebrated her 75th birthday at the Oakland Lake Merritt Sailboat, ha Sailboat House. Yes, yes, yes. And I was taken by a quote that she had, and I'm going to read this because I think it says something about her fiber. She yeah, said, and I quote, I hope young journalists of today will not rely solely on television or the Internet to gain background for story information. They should read, 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 and learn history. And you just said that, that your mother was well-read. 
Oh yeah, she was well read. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you what. When I uh, when I started in show business, and I told her I think I'm gonna be an actor, and she she was very supportive. And this is the phrase that I walked with the whole time. I walk with to this very day is I was having some uh, obstacles, you know. Yeah. And because I wasn't tall like some of the other actors, and. I wasn't getting the dramatic roles. I was getting the comedy roles and stuff like that. And I was, so I was getting a little discouraged. And she said, listen, don't worry about that. She said, there's room at the top. It's the bottom that's crowded. Wow. All you have to do is persevere. And you will achieve your goal. There's room for whoever you are at the top. But you just got to persevere, and that's what I did. And how right she was. How yeah, right at the top. Was. There's always room at the top. You see that every day. plenty of room at the top. It's yeah. never crowded up there. Never. Yeah, no, 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 no. They'll, they'll, they'll find a way. If you come up with something, they'll find a way to shove you right on up there. Absolutely, and that's a good thing for our listeners to hear today. So you've really answered my last comment that I was going to make about your mother, and it was I was going to ask you, what was it like having a mother with such strong values and social consciousness? But I think you've really said it. We we already oh, yeah. got a sense of it already. So yeah, yeah. And, and and also I have to add that my father was an actor here in Los Angeles, and we used to come down every summer and watch him act. And I think that was the other influence. And my father would counsel me also. Uh, about paying dues. He, you know, when I, I when I first started, I was I did Romeo and Juliet when I was 18 in San Francisco, and my father came up and saw it, and I said, Dad, Dad, the the lady director says she's going to pay us in six months, and my father said, Son, that woman ain't going to give you a dime, <laughs> but you're going to learn how to act. Oh, you so you got another payoff. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I remember like six months later, all the actors getting upset. They said, aren't you upset? I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm paying my dues. Exactly. Because, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. We so all I had start... really two wonderful parents that were supportive in my choice. What a blessing. And you know what? Yeah. The truth is, Ted, that all of us, pretty much 99%, I would wager to bet, started out not getting paid a dime, but what we didn't get in the way of money, we earned later because the acting was our training ground in the beginning when we didn't get paid. That's right. That's, that's how it. we that's, learned our craft. That's so that when you finally get a chance at the money, you know what you're doing. You that's know right. how to go in there and uh, audition. You know how to memorize lines. You know how to pull off another actor. All of that is part of paying your dues. That's right, and you've earned it. Yeah, exactly. You've earned it. Now, I wanted to move on and, and talk about, since we're talking about training, I didn't realize you had started acting, you know, so young, ninth grade, but uh, I do know that you studied at London's Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, and what was that training like for you? How was that different from your training prior to that? Well, the English approach Shakespeare differently, totally differently than Americans. I have to tell you this story. I um, I uh, was directing a love boat with Lynn Redgrave. You remember Lynn Redgrave? Oh, of course I do. And so she and I, we started talking about Shakespeare because I had done a number of plays. She, of course, comes from the Redgrave family, and she had done a number of Shakespearean plays. So she asked, she says, have you been to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts? I said, well, no, it's a little late now. I'm, you know, I'm a celebrity. I'm a star on television. You know, it's a little late for that. She said, well, Ted, if you really are an actor, you're going to go get some more training. So then what I did was I investigated it, and I found out they had a special program for Americans during the summer. Yes. And uh, I needed a letter of recommendation, so I called up Lynn Redgrave and I said, Lynn, uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, I want to go to uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, but I need a letter of recommendation. She said, oh, you do? I said, yeah, and if you're really serious about helping me, you know, you're going to write this letter for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did. She wrote the letter. I got into the program, and I studied Shakespeare, and the the great thing about what I learned is there are different roads 
to the same uh, character or speech or play. There are different roads. And the American road is one way that we do ours. But the English, having the English uh, taught me some other technique that I use not only in uh, Shakespeare, but I use it in contemporary theater. And I just did, uh, I was directing uh, Are We There Yet in uh, Connecticut with uh, Terry Crews. Terry Crews is now in the Expendables movie, Expendables 2. Ah. And I felt he had a speech, and I showed him how to do a certain thing with the speech, and he took to it right away. He had a, a, a one-page speech, and I said, Terry, do this here, do that there, bam, 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 bam. It was all English Shakespeare technique. Isn't that interesting? And after and I said, that it was applied to every form of that. You just did Shakespeare. Wow. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. valuable, Ted. Yeah, it is. Well, you know, it, it, the thing about as a director, you want to help an actor. Exactly. And what I have now is an arsenal of tools to help an actor get to the character. And now I don't, I don't only have the Stanislavski or, uh, you know, the methods, the American methods that we use now, the actor Studio and Lee Strasberg and all of those guys, Meisner. I also have the English Avenue that I can take bits and pieces from, from and use that directorially to help an actor uh, achieve his goal of finding the character. What a wonderful byproduct. Yeah, it really is, and I didn't realize it at first because I'm just studying it to use it for myself and my own technique, and then what happens is that the director comes in handy when you see an actor stumble, you know? Exactly. You want to have that actor walk straight and tall, you know, to the part. Exactly. And so I use it, whatever I can use at my fingertips, that's what I use. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, you know, I wanted to ask you this, Ted. When and why did you leave the Bay Area? Uh, connect the dots for me. I know you were born and raised okay, there. Okay, I, I did uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet for two years in San Francisco. Then I went okay. to Colorado, and I did a play in Colorado. Then I came back to the Bay Area. Uh-huh. I came back to the Bay Area to finish off my uh, college degree. I was at San Francisco City College. Okay. And I wanted to get my degree, and my mother was insisting that I get a degree. And while I was at that college, there was a, one of my uh, teacher was starting. This is back in the 60s. Now, my teacher had met two other guys, and they were starting an integrated company. Ah. And I was one of his stronger students, so he said, you're going to be in my company. I said, okay. So we did a play uh that Oscar Brown Jr. turned into a musical. It was called Big Time Buck White. Of course, I remember that. It's a classic. Yeah, we, we did Big Time Buck White as a musical in San Francisco, North Beach area. Yes. And after that, I had risen to a level in the area there where I felt I needed now to challenge myself because I felt I had gone as far as I could go in the Bay Area. Yes. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I know knew exactly all the actors, what you mean. All the actors and directors knew me, but now I, I always wanted to be on television or be in the movies, and so I kept asking people, whenever I did plays, I was like, how do you get in the movies? How do you get on, get on television? How do you do that? And they would say, well, there was a, a local casting person named Ann Brebner in the Bay you Area. You know I know Ann Brebner. She had the yeah, biggest so agency they, in yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, so they would say, you got you to gotta hook up with Ann Brebner. So I did, and then I found out, that Brebner only did movies that had already been cast and they needed one or two liners. Exactly. You know what I mean? For the locals, right. The locals. So they would hire somebody to do two lines, open the door, say, hey, how you doing? Fine, goodbye. You know, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have a real part. So uh, I had an actor say, man, you got to go to L.A. And I said, do I have to shave my beard? And the guy <laughs> said, yeah, you're going to have to shave your beard if you want to act. So I said, oh, man. So I, I finally got to myself, okay, I'm shaving my beard, and I'm going to Los Angeles. And ah. that's what I did, because I wanted to get into the to the big pond. Right. Yeah. Wow. And so from L.A., is that when you then went to New York? Yeah, I, I was in L.A. I didn't get one job in television or, or uh, film, but I got some stage jobs, and I auditioned 
for a musical five times, by the way. I auditioned five times for the musical Hair. I knew you were going to say it was Hair. Yeah, baby, it was Hair. And wow, I, remember, five I got times. to know all of the cast members and everything. I was doing a play, and so they uh, they they were putting together a road show in Vegas. Okay. And uh, not many people wanted to leave L.A., but I didn't have no prospects because I wasn't getting any TV work. So I said, so they called me and said, would you tour in the musical here? We're going to start in Vegas, and then we're going to go to the Midwest. We're going to put the show together in Vegas. I said, absolutely. And they paid me more money than I'd ever gotten in my whole career. I believe it. Oh, so, yeah, it was like $1,500 a week. And I was that was like, a lot of money then. I can't believe it. I was making three hundred dollars a month. If you were <laughs> and lucky, now I was getting fifteen hundred dollars a week. I couldn't believe I it. So I went to Vegas. Uh, this, I mean, uh, they put me in the show there, and uh, I toured all over the country. And when we got to Los, and that was about a year of, of touring. And then when we got to D.C., because when I got in the show, they said, "Hey, you're pretty good. We like you." I said, "Well, send me to New York." Mm. Said, no, 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 you're on the tour, you're on the tour. And so whenever the New York guys would come in, they'd say, hey, you're pretty good. I said, send me to New York. Right. And finally, after about nine months or ten months, they said, okay, okay, yeah, we're going to send you to New York. And I was a happy guy. I know you were. Yes, yeah, so I that went point, to New York. Was it on was Broadway, Broadway or was musical. it on... Was it off Broadway or on Broadway at that point? On there? Broadway, Billmore Theater, on Broadway. Fantastic. Yeah. So what was it like doing here? That was such a controversial play. It was it was one that um, was considered to be the poster child musical of the 60s. It took this look at the hippie culture and the anti-Vietnam War movement and all of that. What was that experience like? Well, first of all, they weren't really actors. They were uh, mainly singers. So you had gospel singers. You had uh, rock and roll singers, you had folk singers. They were singers, they weren't actors. Got but it. I came from the theater, and I'll never forget, I was sitting on the bench, and uh, I was getting ready to go audition, and the guy said, so, uh, what church you belong to? That's said, what funny. Do you yeah, well, who's choir are you singing? That's said, funny. Well, I, I don't sing in a choir. And they are all Broadway? Oh, my God. I don't oh sing God. in a choir. Because they were all church people, all black people. Performers were church people, Dolores Hall, they all came out of the church. Right. So, uh, so you had a mix of people that were, it, it was a wonderful mix of people. They didn't call them actors, they called them the tribe. Oh. Uh, it, had, it was a different, it was a subculture in theater in that they didn't approach it in a traditional way that most theater companies did because they were a revolution unto themselves. They were trying to convert people to, you know, um, letting the sun shine in. You know what I mean? Right. We were, One we were song. trying to convert people, you know. Right. Yes, yeah, so it, was a, it was a different kind of deal from your typical Broadway show or your typical American theater tour. Got you. But it fit the period. It fit the times. Yeah, it, it, it was very much a product of the time. Yes. Very yes. much a product of that time. And since I was from San Francisco and been protesting and all of that, I knew that whole game. You know what exactly. I'm saying? I knew about marching and sit-ins and, uh, you know, people smoking stuff they shouldn't be smoking. And right. All of the above. Stuff they yeah, I'm from San Francisco, so I know that whole culture. Exactly. Now, Ted, tell me this. Did you act, dance, and sing what we call a triple threat when an actor can do all three? Well, yeah, I did all three. Uh, some will argue I did so, certain things better than others. <laughs> but I did all <laughs> three, baby. I was in there, and um, I, what I did was I understudied the black lead, which was a character named HUD. Uh -huh. And uh, I had a little routine that I did called the Young Recruit that we did at that time, and that was kind of my... Uh, my um, mark on the play. And what happens is the play here was done all over the world. So if somebody new came into the play and they developed a bit, because they were always improvising, if somebody ah. developed a bit that they liked, that bit would go to Germany, Stockholm, New York, Chicago, Seattle. All the hair companies say, hey, there's a guy on the road and he's doing this. You try this. 
Wow. What a yeah, compliment. So I, I had a bit called The Young Recruit, and some of my bits traveled all over the world that I developed while I was doing the show. That is so amazing. So, Ted, after you did that show, did you stick around New York, or did you come on back to L.A. right away? No, no, I was in New York. I was very happy to be in New York. I did a, a movie. I did some commercials. And I got into a Broadway show called Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death with Marvin oh, Van Peeble. That's right. I remember that. Yeah, and what happened, that's where my playwriting was born. Uh, I was doing the play, and I, I watched Melvin, and I, you know, and I watched what he did with Ain't Supposed to Die and a, guy, a director named Gilbert Moses. And so uh, I started writing because I always felt I was going to achieve something, but it wasn't happening fast enough. So I asked one of the actors in this. I got into Ain't Supposed to Die, and, and I did this part, and everybody said I did it well. So I said to this guy, I said, what's the deal? When do, I, you know, when do people knock on my door and give me movies and stuff like that? He said, hey, man. You're paying your dues. <laughs> wow, you that's know, funny. This is the game right here. Exactly. This is the game. Now, Ted, you I want to exa- take a moment to do a station identification break. We've been talking so much. I was going to do one about 10 minutes ago. Let me do one right now, okay? Okay. And so basically what I'd like to say to our listeners is that you're listening to Blake Radio's Rainbow Soul, my show Adila, and my very special guest today Mr. Ted Lange. Now, Ted, I wanted to uh, also move now toward your career that, that went in the direction of TV. And although many audiences, many TV audiences remember you well from your work on The Love Boat, there are also some who are listening today who go back even further than that with you. And by that, I mean when you worked on the series ABC also, That's My Mama, as the character Junior, who was suave, he was good-humored, he was a lady man, and I understand that you guys did like 38 episodes. So was it on two seasons? Yes, it was. It was on two seasons, yeah. Two seasons. That's an interesting story. I came out from New York. Right. Uh, I I came out for something else. I wrote wrote a little one-act play. Uh They gave they gave it to some people at Columbia. Columbia was doing a, a show called Temperatures Rising with Cleavon Little. Ah. And they said, they said they were looking for writers. And so I had delusions of Dick Van Dyke, of the <laughs> Dick Van Dyke show. I thought that I would be a writer, write myself a part, and, and then become an actor on the show on Temperatures Rising. Ah. So they uh, said, you know, we really like your writing, but you're here in New York, and if you were in L.A., we would introduce you to the executive produce, producer, uh, Bill Asher. And so I went back to Ain't Supposed to Die, quit, got on an airplane, flew out to L.A., called up the lady at Columbia and said, I'm here in L.A., uh, when are you going to introduce me to Bill Asher? Wow. And I said, well, wait, 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 I thought you were in the play. I said, I quit, and I came here. Now, and that was risky uh, business. Yeah. But I was, it was naive to tell you. So she said, well, uh, let me set this up. Call me tomorrow. So I called her the next day. She was out to lunch. I called her the next day. She was out to lunch. And I called her every day, different hours. She was always out to lunch. And that's how I figured out what that means. Out yes. to lunch. Yes. And for so those listeners they, who are listening now, they need to take heed. <laughs> yes. They never had any intention of introducing me to Bill Asher. It was just something they were saying, you know what I mean? Oh, wow, Ted. Yeah, so here I was, back in L.A. Uh, I went up and I enrolled in the American Film Institute to study directing. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to write a show, go back to New York Shakespeare Festival because I had a friend there. And I wanted to get as much knowledge as I could. So I got into the American Film Institute, and while I was studying film in the daytime, I was writing at night, and I was going to, uh, after the two-year session, I, I hoped to have a play put together and go back to New York to the Shakespeare Festival. While I was doing I was auditioning for shows, and the New York agent that I had said, listen, they're doing a show called First Family of Washington 
which was Godfrey Cambridge. So I went and uh, met them to audition. They said, well, you can't audition. We already cast it. I said, well, why'd you call me in? Wow. They said, well, we, we heard you were a talented guy. And uh, so I did a scene from Ain't Supposed to Die, and they liked it. And they said, well, we'll keep you in mind for the next show that we do. And I went to myself. I said, that's a waste of time. So then I went back to AFI and studying directing. They did a pilot of the first family of Washington with uh, Godfrey Cambridge and Teresa Merritt. They liked Teresa Merritt. They didn't like Godfrey Cambridge, so they said, we're going to do a second pilot, and we're going to call it That's My Mama. Isn't that something? So I went, and they called me back and said, look, we got rid of everybody that was in the first pilot. You're lucky you weren't in the first pilot. <laughs> and so they said, uh, okay, uh, here's the character. It's a character named Junior. Now, here's a very important thing at the end that I have to tell you. What? You have to treat everybody fair. You have Absolutely. Underscore to treat, you have to treat everybody letter. with dignity. That's right. So there were three guys, me, a guy named Ray Vitti, and a third guy. We were all auditioning. We were all doing a screen test. Ah. So I went around and I introduced myself to the prop guy and I introduced myself to the DP, the director of photography. I introduced myself to the uh, the gaffers and the grips and all of that. And I was, I said, well, what is this? What do you do? Why are you? And the guy, they were telling me stuff and this and that. So the producers were hot on a guy named Ray Vitti. I don't know if you remember Ray. At I don't all. remember Ray. Ray was, they were hot on him. The other guy was the, probably the most gorgeous man you ever seen in your life, but he wasn't funny and he couldn't act. Well, so if they wanted a pretty boy, they would go with that guy. Right. If they wanted a guy that could, that was funny and tall, they could go with Ray. Now, I was short and dark, but I was funny. They and so could act. Thing, huh? And could act. And I could act, and I was funny. So here's the thing that put me over. The prop guy came over to me because the bit was about uh, somebody, uh, a junior hustling these people. And uh, this prop guy came over to me. He says, you know, everybody's betting on that Ray guy to take this. I'm betting on you. Wow. I said, I said really? He goes, yeah. So use the phone. I said, what do you mean? He said, the pay phone. Use the pay phone. And I looked at him and I said, use the pay phone? He said, check the coin return while you're doing your lines. Because you're a hustler. Right? I go, yeah, right, right. He said, check the coin return. Now, that's a good little bit. It is, but was there a phone in the room where you were auditioning? Well, yeah, there was a phone in the scene. There was a pay phone in the scene, so they said use, nobody was using the phone. Oh, so they literally had the phone as a prop in the audition? On the set. Got it, set. got it. Oh, they you were on the set. set. Okay. They built a barbershop set. Oh, it was and already there. The got it. Got it. You got what I'm saying now? Yeah, the set was already there. Yeah, so we filmed the screen test on the set. Wow. So in the middle of my speech, I checked the coin return. Good for you. But the only reason I got it is because I was nice to the prop man. See, there is the lesson for all of our listeners. Yeah, and, uh, you know, those crew guys, they've seen every joke coming down the pike. I'm sure. And so this guy said, well, look, I'm looking at these guys, and they don't even get that they should be using the phone. And the Check director didn't give them that bit. I'm going to give this guy that bit. You used your set. You used the set. You used the set. You gave him what he said. Use the phone. So I used the pay, pay phone, and I saw Ray Vitti about a, two or three weeks later. He said, man, when you, need, when you use the pay phone, I knew I was gone. <laughs> He was well, he was right right. Right. That man was an angel to you. Yes, he was. He was your angel. Now, you know, yes. two things Two things I want to say right here. One is, in listening to you, what I realize is that, Ted, you were always with a plan. 
you always had a backup plan. If something didn't work out, you were always one step ahead of the game. You always had a plan B. Yeah. That's the oh, first yeah, thing absolutely. I wanted to say, and and that's remarkable, and I hope our listeners are listening to that, not putting all well, your eggs in one basket. And then number two, could you explain what a screen test is? I know some of the listeners are probably going, but what happens at a screen test? Okay, what happens in a screen test is they have maybe two or three people that they're not sure about or that they say they're the high contenders. And what they do is they take a scene, and the actors learn the scene by heart, then they film the scene. Now, we were lucky in that we filmed our scene on a set, because some screen tests, they don't film on a set. They right. don't film you, were you blessed. in a room. You were blessed. Yes, I was very blessed. And so they built a set. This is back in the old days, though. This is like 73, 74. Yeah, I don't so think they back in the old now. days, they would build the set. Right. And they'd have the cameras come down, they'd bring out the film cameras, film directors, and the whole nine yards. And uh, so what you do is you then do your take on the scene, and then they film it, and then they bring it, they take you out, then they bring in another actor, he does his take on the scene, and then they bring in a third actor. And then what they do is they then go back to the studio and they look at all of the takes, all of the guys that did their scenes, and they say, well, I like this A guy better than C guy, and... I turned out to be the guy they liked. And they're also able to see how you look on film or on tape. Exactly. They're able to see you and, and, and see I how you might you translate. So the fact that I was 5'7 worked in my favor, whereas the guy that was taller, 6'1", six, 6'3", six he didn't look as much like a kid. Do you know what I'm saying? Ah. And, and I they wanted to kind of boy quality, huh? I shaved my beard. And you shaved that beard. Wow. One last yeah. question about that show before we take another station break real quickly. What was it like working on that show? What a cast you had. Teresa Merritt as the mother, Clifton Davis as her son, Teddy Wilson as the mailman, and on. Yeah, it, was, it was an education. I learned more uh, doing that show, which has held me in good stead to this very day. Uh, I would judge a lot. We used to do this in front of a live audience. And back in those days, you did a, a dress rehearsal and you did a performance show. Okay. An air show. And then they would take the best scenes from both and edit it together into one thing. And what I did was, what I learned is, the crew, the camera guys, when you were camera blocking, which is, they were setting the cameras, the crew would watch what you've done for a week. If they chuckled, it was a good laugh. Yes. If they if they laughed out loud, it was a big laugh. If they Got smiled, it. it was a little laugh. It wasn't much of a laugh. So they were listening. And, yeah, so you you knew where the big laughs were just through camera blocking and watching the cameraman react to what they had to later shoot. That's fantastic. So stuff like that. So I learned about that. I learned about... Uh, you know, craft service, I learned about costuming and how to, you know, uh, fortify your character through costume. I mean, right. it was just a wonderful education. Excellent. And, of course, craft service means uh, the place where all the food's laid out, where you can go and get your snacks in between your takes and your scenes. Now, let's yeah. do a station identification break again. Uh, for everyone who just may have tuned in and are wondering, what in the heck am I listening to? You're listening to Blake Radio's Rainbow Soul the show Adila, and my guest today is Mr. Ted Lange. Now, Ted, yeah. uh, okay, so moving forward, uh, let's now talk about your move from a show that people first came to know you, loved you, that's my mama, and then something else came along. And this, of course, was the role of Isaac Washington, the fun-loving bartender on the Pacific Luxury Liner, and yep. uh, the Love Boat, initially it was called later Love Boat. And I want to ask you, what was it like being cast in that show? What was that experience like? But even more than that, first of all, how did you land that role? Okay, here's what happened as far as me getting the role. I, uh, after that's my mom folded, 
Uh, I auditioned for a half hour sitcom called Mr. T and Tina, which was Pat Morita. Pat Morita was on Happy Days, and he left Happy Days, and they were going to give him his own series. Uh-huh. And um, uh, I got cast on that show. I auditioned, got cast on that show. And what was interesting about that show was the writing wasn't as strong as the writing was on That's My Mama. Yes, well, I knew did. how to deliver a joke. Okay. So, yeah, that was very important. So, because of the experience that I had on uh, That's My Mama, I knew what I did, how to take what I had to do and make it funny. Well, the show went along, and I, I, I started out with, like, maybe only going to do two shows as a recurring guest star, and they turned it into a a bigger part, because whenever I came on, I got on my last, and when I left, the the tone of the show dropped, so the network took notice of that, huh. and what they, did, they, what they did, they canceled uh, Mr. T and Tina, but they were casting Rubble, and they went to Doug Kramer, and they said, this is the guy we want, we want this guy, wow. and you know we can deliver the good, so I never auditioned for Love Boat. What a blessing. And I used to tease Bernie Coppell, who played the doctor, because Bernie said, you know, I do my screen test, and I didn't see you there. Where, you know, did you come early in the morning? Did you come later in the evening? Because I was there most of the day. I didn't see you. I said, well, Bernie, uh, the really good people didn't have to audition. <laughs> and he you know, like, there's a well, lesson really, really in that. Well, you know, they know I was good, so they just hired me. You know, the guys who are sure about, like you, you had to do a screen test. So Check that out. I would, I would tease Bray for the next two years. Whenever that he messed so up, funny. whenever he dropped the line or flung something, I said, that's why you had to. Uh, that is him. so <laughs> funny. You know, at the end of the day, it's really, and I think you've really said it by this example you've just given, that to a great extent, not only in our business, but really in all businesses, a lot has to do with relationships. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And listening to you, I can see how different opportunities came through you by who you were meeting. Yeah. Relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and, making, and, and hopefully making a good impression, you know? Exactly. And your yeah. work speaking for itself as well as your work, work ethic. Now, what was it like working on a show where you had such wonderful guest stars week after week, most of whom were recognizable celebrities who had an opportunity to work, many of whom maybe were not working regularly, but they knew if they got on that love boat, they had a dynamite guest starring role. Well, not only that, it revived some of the careers, you know. Um, it, some of the careers, I'm trying to think of who the guy is that did Kismet. Um, 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 I can't think of his name, but one of the actors came on. He later went on to Dallas and became uh, Howard Keel. Howard ah. Keel came on my show, and he hadn't worked in a long time. And I'll never forget this. He he did a scene, and the uh, director said, Tuck, tight. And Howard Keel, I thought I was shaking his head no. So I went up to him and said, what's the matter? He said, well, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. I could have did a better job. I'm a little rusty. Ah. I, said, I said, well, no, you, that, that seemed like, he said, no, no, that's not what I'm capable of. And by the end of the second day, I saw him and he was nodding his head, yes. Mm. And I said, I said, what's up? What, what's, what's going on? He says, I got it back. Excellent. <laughs> he said, I got it back. I know, you know, I'm back in the group now. He just said, needed to he, work out. So, huh? He just needed to work out, flex his creative he, muscles. Yeah, you needed to work out. You needed to work And that's the other thing that I always, I learned that from Howard Keel. Don't stop acting. That's right. Don't stop acting. Don't stop acting. Do something. Now, play somewhere. One person show. Stand up. Do something somewhere because you'll get lucky. It's a muscle just like anything else. That's right. And you yeah, got to keep it strong. Up. You know, that. Yeah, I learned that from Howard Keel. But what was great was I got a, I got to meet a lot of the people I grew up watching in the movies and on television. I got to direct uh, Clint Walker, who was Cheyenne. Yes. 
And I was like a 10-year-old kid. Oh, my God. And I just kind of sat at his feet and had him tell stories. You know, I mean, that's that's the way the show was. The the show was lovely in that way that uh, we met a lot of people uh, that were wonderful stars in our childhood. And then we also were uh, the springboard for a lot of people getting started. Tom Hanks, Martin Short. All those guys made appearances on our show when they were just getting started. Wow, before we even knew who they were. Before we knew who they were, John Ritter, Suzanne Summers, they all came through, Shelly uh, Hack. Uh, um, yeah, you know, it was uh, Shelly Long. Right. Uh, you know, that's that was their first and ever, Lonnie Anderson. You know what I mean? They all that's came through. That's amazing. It. Well, after yeah, yeah. with ten seasons, there certainly were a lot of guest stars who came through. Now, Ted, I wanted to ask you, being so associated with the role as you have been with the role that you had on Love Boat as Isaac Washington, how has that been for you, uh, life after Love Boat, in terms of your career? Has that been a blessing? Has that sometimes been hard for you? What has that been like when you have been so associated with the role for so long? Well, it's a double-edged sword. Um, theatrically, I can go anywhere in the country and know that if my name is on the marquee, people are going to come see the show, so you know, see the play. That's so that, that's a blessing, because I did Driving Miss Daisy, and I toured all over the country. Uh, I did a couple of other plays. I, I just did uh, Lear uh, two years ago in New York, uh, off-Broadway, and that was good. So, yeah. But film-wise, sometimes it has, it's been hurtful in that people say, well, no, that's not what we're going to do. But if it's a low-budget movie, they're happy to have you. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because you've got you know, big Yeah, big studio people say, well, no, we're going to get somebody else. We're going to get uh, this guy over here, Denzel. We want Denzel or Sam Jackson. I said, I, I could do that part. I said, yeah, 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 sure. But if it's a low-budget movie... You you have some cachet because people recognize you and they recognize your name. Exactly. So I've done a lot That's of movies, blessing. some of which got shown, some of which have never seen the light of day, but they were fun to do. So I'm exactly. making a living. And you kept working. You kept working. You know what and, I love the most, yeah. And not only that, Ted, you've crossed over. You're now a director. You're a playwright. You're a screenwriter. Yeah. You're a producer. You're an educator. You have over 50 plays under your belt. A lot of actors wish they could say they've done 50 plays. You're yeah. still performing on stage, and yeah. you've really left your mark there as an actor. And then crossing over to playwriting, you've penned at least 19 plays. I think it might be more now, is it? No, 24 now. That's what I'm saying. I knew it was more than that now. 24, 24 I got plays. a new play that opens up uh, September 7th here in Hollywood. It's called Lady Patriot. Let's play and it now. And we're going to be at the Hudson Theater. The Hudson Theater, and for those who are not sure where the Hudson is, it's in Hollywood. It's on Santa Monica Boulevard. And, and uh, if, you, if you call plays411.com, you can get tickets to see the show. Perfect. And then if you're there, perhaps if someone has heard you on the show, they can just stick around and say, I heard you on that radio interview you did. And we that say hello. I, I demand that they say hello. That's huh? what we want to meet those people. Exactly, exactly. Now, in terms of your plays, you've written so many plays, and I know that included in that you've had historical uh, figures that you've portrayed or that you've written about. You uh, you wrote about Ira Aldridge, and you also played him, didn't you? No, I, I didn't play him. Uh, Charles Weldon, who runs the NEC in New York, played him, and I recently did a revival of it at the North Carolina Black Rep Company. You directed I wrote a there, musical. Right? I wrote a musical about the life of Ira Aldridge, yes. Okay, you wrote the musical. And, then and what I did was I used the rock and roll singers that I knew from here and a gospel singer that I knew growing up to write the songs and lyrics for the play. So I wrote the book and then I had my friends write the songs. God, it was, it, God, yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I bet it was. And for those who don't know, Ira Aldridge was considered to be the first African American Shakespearean actor, and he was born in the early 1800s. Many of us don't know that. Yeah, and yeah, eighteen, yeah, eighteen thirties. 
Yeah. yeah and, and, then, and he went on to to uh, travel all over Europe all doing over the world. He later did Shylock. He did a lot of the great Shakespearean plays. All over the world. Well respected all over, all yeah, over Europe. the world. And then there was another historical figure you wrote about, Biddy Mason. A lot of Biddy people Mason, don't know yes. who she is. And she, that was a musical as well, right, Ted? Yeah, I did that with Barbara Morrison played Biddy Mason. We did it down at LATC. Now, the thing about wow. Biddy Mason is, and Biddy Mason, Mason. There was, uh, there's a law that was going on in the 1850s that, that Biddy helped to challenge. But uh, she won her freedom, and she ended up starting the first AME church in Los Angeles. So that right. church, if you ever go to the first AME church, that's the church that Billy Mason started in 1800. That's right. In fact, I think they have her picture on that big mural up there. That's right. And she owned all the land downtown. Sure did, on Spring Street for sure. On Spring Street. So you know what LATC is? That's, it sits on part of her property. That was a property, and that's where I did my reading of Biddy Mason, and at the end of the play, I said, ladies and gentlemen, where do you want to see this land was run by Biddy Mason? How and it was a wonderful quote at the evening, you know? How fitting was that? Yeah, you know, yeah. I want to take a moment to also talk about how you've given back. One of the ways you gave back, you were an adjunct professor in the School of Cinema and TV at USC. Uh, you've also lectured on Shakespeare in high schools and colleges across the country. You worked yeah. on the Directors Guild of America's um, fellowship program. You yeah. also, and, and what's interesting about that program as I was researching that was that it was formed to, it was instituted to develop job opportunities for women and ethnics of color, which I found fascinating. Yeah, so oh, you've yeah, done absolutely. a lot. You've done uh, a lot yeah. to give back, and including co-chairing uh, the Directors Guild African American Steering Committee. So you really have given back not only to the youth, but also those in our profession. I just want to tip my hat to you for what you've done. Well, that comes from my mom, who you know. Yes. And my dad. I mean, that's what, particularly in the 60s, that's something that they instilled in us, that that's what we should be doing. You know, that's exactly. you can't. You can't rise and not pull somebody up with you, you know. I mean, that's, that's right. just not right. Each one, teach one. Now, I, I have two other questions. I can't believe our time is almost up. We've got like six minutes, but I want to really get these two questions in there, Ted. And one is, uh, for those who are listening who are interested in breaking into the business, what advice would you give them? I always ask my guests that because... You guys have done it. You've been successful. Those of you who have been the guests on the show. And there are those who are listening going, God, I wish I could do it. I really want to do it. What advice would you say to those listening who want to break into the business? Well, uh, if you want to be an actor, I say you join some theater company, some acting troupe. You come down to L.A., you find some, and there's a lot, a lot of theaters, but you go around and you see which theater that you like that's saying the stuff that you like what they're saying or stuff that you want to say. Join that company. Help out. You don't have to be an actor at first. You can be uh, uh, turning on the lights. You can be running the lights. You can get into a theater company that you like. If you want to be a filmmaker, I say start making movies. Go to the American Film Institute, USC, UCLA. And if you can't get any of those, make movies on your own. And what you do is, the minute you start to do that, you are going to meet other people that are on the same page with you. And that's where you start to develop relationships and to learn your craft. And where you can also meet people who know more than you so you can learn from. And they, and they will teach you. They're happy to teach you. They're glad to pass it on. Yes. You know, so what you want to do is you want to say, what do you want? You want to be a costumer? Find out where the costuming people work, who, who they are. Find out their names. Ask them if they need assistance. Be a gopher. Work for no money. Pay some dues. Because the Believe experience you for is just as valuable as You know, money. remember Sonny Bono? Huh? You, do you remember Sonny Bono? You know I remember Sonny, Sonny Bono of, of uh, Sonny Cher. And Cher. Sonny, and Sonny Cher. Bono told me that he wanted to learn how to be a record producer, so he went up to um, Phil Spector and said, I want to be a, 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 a record producer. And I said, I want to be, you know, I want to help. I want to be an assistant. He said, I don't need an assistant. 
He says, I'll be a gopher. He says, I don't need a gopher. And I ain't paying you no money. And, and so he was like, I'll do it for free. And what he did was, the guy said, no, but he'd just hang out. And so finally, one day, he said, hey, go get us some cheeseburgers. And that was it. He was in. And so then he started doing more and more for Phil Spector, but he hung out at the place he wanted to be. And gradually, the guy let him in. Opportunity knocked. Opportunity knocks, baby. And the last and, so was, and, and that's where he met Sherry. He saw Sherry. He said, who's that girl over there? She could sing. And, and she not only did she sing, she was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and so she said, she can't sing. Dolly and Love can sing. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah you're a honey. The black girls can sing. That girl can't sing. And, and so he said, well, I think I'm going to work with her. I'm going to write a song for her. Because he learned how to write a song. Being around Phil Spector, he learned how to produce a record. All of that. But he started out for free. Got Going to get hamburgers. Got it. Now, my last yeah. question, uh, Ted, we got two minutes. What would you say to those who say, I want to be famous? I always ask these last two questions at the end because uh, there are those who think fame is a be-all, end-all. In one sentence, what would you say? Well, I would say, you know, that's good luck to you. That's great. If you want to be famous, go for it. But there's more to the game than just being famous. <laughs> Exactly. Those things that you're going to sustain yourself are lost in the business if all that you crave is fame because lots of lights turn on, burn bright, and then they go out. There you, you know? go. So you got to get the chop. Huh? you got to have the chop. So it looks like we gotta we got to close now, but Ted, okay. I so enjoy having had you. It's been well, a very you. inspirational interview. I'm going to see you in March for the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival's 20th anniversary. Yahoo! And yeah, also, baby. I'm looking forward to that. We're delighted to have you again and again and again. You always support us. And to my listeners, you're listening to Adila on the Blake Radio Network, Rainbow Soul. I'd like to hear from you and find out what you thought about today's show. You can reach me at www.adilabarnes.com. Also, help keep Blake Radio on the air by becoming a subscriber today. And remember to dance, dance, dance like nobody's watching and enjoy your miracle today. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather. 